In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly King, Paraclete, Spirit of Truth, You who are everywhere present and fill all things, treasury of all that is good, master of life, come dwell within us, cleanse us from all stain, and save our souls, O good one. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, I'd like to say a word about one of the words in that prayer. It's a, Greek, it's a prayer in Greek. Uh, it's used in the liturgy of John Chrysostom quite a bit. It starts off, Vasile Voranie Paraclite, Topenema Tisalitias, and so forth. And then it says, Elte Kiskino Senenimin. I was, there was a word struck me and I wanted to, oh, Zoes. Zoes Kodigos. Translated Master of Life. But the Zoes Kodigos, you see, uh, is the, uh, the Kodigos, is the leader of the choir in a, in a Greek drama. You watch him, you do just what he does. But it's also, Kodigos is used for the person, the rich person who funds it, you know, supplies the money for putting on this drama. So the Holy Spirit is the one who supplies everything and who leads it. He's the Zoes Kodigos. He's the choir leader of life. He's the patron, supporter of life. But it's too much to say all that. So the translation just says, Master. But every day when I say it, I keep thinking, wouldn't they like to know that we're calling this Holy Spirit the Zoes Kodigos? The leader and the one who provides everything we need for the choir. Anyway, now down to business. Um, I want to look at, uh, continue looking at this study of mine, it happens to be, on uh, Bishop Cardinal Pope Ratzinger on uh, the Word of God. The first part is called The Unique Power and Dignity of the Word. I'm going to base myself on Pope Benedict's phrase, only the Word of God can profoundly change man's hearts. That's very profound. You want to change man's hearts? Preach the Word. I wish to reflect briefly on the matter in which tradition has appreciated this fact about the preached Word. Commenting on 2 Timothy 3.16, huh? all Scripture divinely inspired is useful for and so forth. Aquinas asks why only the scriptures should be divinely inspired, since according to Ambrose, any quote here, anything true by no matter whom said is from the Holy Spirit. His response is that God works, as St. Thomas says, in two ways. One that is immediate, and this pertains to him alone, such as is the case with miracles, and one that is mediate, that is, through the mediation of lesser causes, as is the case with natural operations. He then says, and thus in man, God instructs the intellect both immediately, miraculously, through the sacred letters, and immediately through all other writings. So the the scripture has this capacity to be used by God to instruct us immediately. Not just the words on the text, it's the Lord. Okay. This is not a chance expression. St. Thomas attributes a unique causality to Scripture. Commenting on Pseudo-Dionysius' treatise on the divine names, he says, Dionysius, in his teaching, depends upon the authority of sacred Scripture, which has strength and power, robor et virtus, because the prophets and apostles were moved to speak by the Holy Spirit who was revealing to them and speaking in them. So the tradition goes way back, you see, that uh, the uh, authority of Scripture is direct. Again, this is Aquinas, when commenting on Hebrews 5, 12 to 14, which is describing the uh, uh, being fed by the word, the text, the Hebrew text, Hebrews text, the audience is told that they need someone 
to teach them again the oracles of God, and that they need milk, not solid food. If you look it up on chapter 5, you'll see that. Now, this is Aquinas' reflection on that. For Sacra Doctrina, sacred teaching, which is one of the synonyms often for Scripture in Aquinas, is food and drink, because it nourishes and satisfies the soul. The other sciences only enlighten the mind. This one, however, enlightens the soul. This is a characteristic of sacred scripture, now he calls it, of the teaching of sacred scripture, doctrina sacra scriptura, that in it not only speculative things are handed on, but those that are to be practiced for activity. I want to give you another one. This is from uh, Henri de Lubac. The notion that sacred scripture is a unique part of sacra doctrina is a solid part of the tradition that St. Thomas is uh, summing up. Henri de Lubac expresses that same tradition by saying, Henri de Lubac is one of the great theologians of the 20th century. He's French. He was made a cardinal at the end of his life. One of the great understanders of tradition and its understanding of scripture. Okay, this is one of his quotes. Scripture is not only divinely guaranteed, it is divinely true. The Spirit did not only dictate it, dictate it, he is, as it were, contained in it. He inhabits it. His breath perpetually animates it. The press, the Scripture is, and then he gives a quote, made fruitful by a miracle of the Holy Spirit. It is uh, full of the Spirit. Those two letter uh, animated and so forth, they are quotes from the patristic writers. Because of this, tradition saw the words of Scripture, particularly those of the Gospels, as being the body of Christ. Now, we've had that phrase before, a few weeks ago. We were using Verbum Domini and talking about that point in Verbum Domini, uh, number 56, I think, uh, where the Pope is saying that analogously, Christ in the Word and in the preached Word is present analogously there in the same way he is, well, in an analogous way, to the Eucharist. Now, uh, this is something like that, what de Lubac says. Because of this presence, tradition saw the words of Scripture, particularly those of the Gospels, as being the body of Christ. The originator of this concept was Origen, whose views are also summed up by de Lubac. This is another quote by de Lubac, summing up Origen's view, who has been very nicely reinstated by uh, Pope Benedict gave three talks on him in the Wednesday audiences to encourage people to get to know him and to read him. Anyway, this is de Lubac. In the letter of Scripture, the Logos is not incarnated properly, so-called, in a way that he is in the humanity of Jesus. Nevertheless, he is truly incorporate, incorporated there. He himself dwells there, and not only some idea about him. Then I comment, to speak of the Scriptures as the temple of the Holy Spirit, or as being animated by the Spirit of Christ, or as the body of Christ, is an attempt to provide a basis for and articulate a common Christian experience, namely, that the words of Scripture exercise a unique kind of causality and that activity by which God teaches us here and now. They are unique. They're a special gift. And we can retain all the historical work that's been done so far. We can't forget this. See? About no other text is it said in the same way that it is the Word of God. No other text receives the same liturgical honors. At a solemn Mass, there are two candles on either side of the Gospel book when it's being uh, read out, right? No other text is spoken about in the way that Scripture is described. Therefore, uh, there is a way in which the, the authority of sacred Scripture is unique. It can cause knowledge immediately, and now I'm just summing up the quotes that I gave. Huh? It can cause knowledge immediately, and possessed of a unique power, it can have a referential function that brings us into contact with the divine realities themselves in a way that exceeds other faith, faith formations. 
And that notion to call that referential, uh, you can find in the in the uh, Pontifical Biblical Commission's uh, study, uh, the Bible and Christology. I'm quoting now. The auxiliary languages used in the course of the church's history do not have for faith the same authority as the referential languages used by the sacred author. So the distinguishing between the auxiliary and the referential. One is serving revelation, the other is putting you right in touch with it. Uh, isn't this exciting? To be able to learn this about Scripture? And this is all Pope Benedict, the Biblical Commission, and so forth. Scripture's moral teaching that derives from the revelational act and participates in it in that act. And so, um, Scripture, you see, revelation is more than Scripture to the extent that reality exceeds its verbal expression. And also because there can be Scripture without revelation as when a non-believer reads Scripture. Here's a quote. Revelation always and only becomes a reality where there is faith. It is a living reality which calls for the living man as the location of his presence. That's also from the Pontifical Biblical Commission. Now, uh, Joseph Ratzinger expresses the same principle elsewhere by saying that for St. Bonaventure, revelation refers not to the letter of Scripture, but to the understanding of, this, of the letter. And this understanding can be increased. Do you see the accent on a spiritual activity? So when we read the Scriptures, we have to be praying and being open to the movement of the Holy Spirit who wants to put our heart in symphony with the reality that is mediated directly, huh? immediately, the, the St. Thomas said, by the sacred text. This is quite powerful, isn't it? Okay. Um, in regard to interpretation, we may consider this text of Aquinas, the text I'm going to read, who specifically attributes the understanding of Old Testament prophecy to a prophetic gift. In other words, understand the Old Testament prophecy. You need a pro pro prophetic gift. Here's the quote. They are also called prophets in the New Testament who expound the prophetic sayings because sacred scripture is interpreted in the same spirit in which it is composed. So when we start to read scripture, we should pray and say, Blessed Holy Spirit, explain to me what you said. To teach me through these words. What are you thinking? What are you saying? What are you communicating? Um, and I'll read this last one. On the level of mystical prayer, we may quote Henri de Lubac again as a description of scripture and mysticism. It's a very powerful text. Since Christian mysticism develops through the action of the mystery, the mystery being what? The Christ in you, the help of, hope of glory, right? The action of the mystery received in faith and the mystery is the incarnation of the Word of God revealed in Scripture. Christian mysticism is essentially an understanding of the holy books. You read St. Teresa closely or John of the Cross, you'll see that. Thus, mystery is their meaning. Mysticism is getting to know that meaning. Thus, one understands the profound and original meaning, identity of the two meanings of the word mystique, that in current French usage seems so different because we have had to separate so much in order to analyze them. The mystical or spiritual understanding of Scripture and the mystical or spiritual life are in the end one and the same. If you're not being mystically transformed by the Lord, you're not going to mystically correctly understand the text because it's mediating divine truth. Well, that's enough for this week. Uh, but I thought it would be nice to sort of uh, go through those.